thing. When the Warrens did the seance, was it was it pretty much straight away that they decided to go with that, or was it from a few different visits and they thought that would be the best way to go with it? That was their fifth visit mm. to the farm. They only came back one other time after that, and my mother wouldn't let them in the house, but they came back to see if my mother was still alive because the night of the seance, she was laying unconscious in the middle of our parlor floor after having been uh, thrown in the chair in which she sat from the middle of our dining room into mm. the parlor. And honestly, when mom's head struck the floor, I think everybody in that house thought we had just seen her die. Mm -hmm. It was horrific, horrific. That's why I tell you, you know, I don't know if demons exist. Honest to God, Jared, Jay, I, I cannot tell you that demons exist. Mm -hmm. The Warrens would say that they do and that that's why exorcists exist to mm -hmm. vanquish the demons. But I've never seen a demon. I don't know what a demon is. I do know that pure evil exists. Yeah. And whatever it was that night that infiltrated my mother and attacked her, during yeah. a seance that went so horribly wrong that it almost cost her her life. I can also likewise tell you that it had all the power that it could possibly have needed to claim her life and didn't. It wanted, I believe it wanted to make its presence known to the Warrens. Yeah. And it certainly did as well as everybody else that was in the house. And yeah. they had come to the house that night with a priest and a medium and an audio specialist and cinematographers. And my father was livid. He didn't yeah. want this to happen. Four of the five of us were home. Only mm. Nancy was away at a friend's house for the night and the rest of us were home. And, the, you know, to bring a medium into that house with four kids yeah. and conduct a seance and throw open wide the doors to the netherworld and beckon everything forth to determine who a culprit was in the house was, as far as I'm concerned, the height of irresponsibility. Oh. Um, we should never have witnessed what we saw that night. But it was a couple of months later. Uh, my father threw the Warrens out of the house that night after he punched Ed Warren in the face for trying to stop him from going to my mother. Um, when she had been injured, mm -hmm. um, it was you know, very ugly. Nothing like nothing like in the film. It was mm -hmm. a very, very ugly scene. Um, and I'm not saying that it's not compelling in the film, but I'll tell you what, my mother, I thought my mother was going to freak out when she finally saw, she didn't see the movie until a couple of years after it came out on DVD. She wouldn't go to the theater to see it. She is very reclusive. She never leaves home. And, um, but we got the DVD and one night she came to myself and my sister, Christine, and she said, okay, I'm ready. And, you know, we had forewarned her about things that were in the movie, um, especially the scene where she's poised with a pair of scissors over my sister's heart. Yeah. And we thought, oh, she's gonna just lose it when she sees that. She thought that was patently absurd. My mm. mother never did anything to harm us ever and wanted nothing but to protect her children and mm. tried like hell to get us out of that house once she realized that the house was haunted. Whether or not my father believed it at the time mattered not to her. She wanted to get us out of what she perceived to be a dangerous situation. Um, but we ended up staying there for a full 10 years for a variety of reasons. And as I stated earlier, first and foremost among them was, I think, because we were supposed to, or it would yeah. have happened a different way, or we never would have gone there in the first place. Um, there was some draw on our family to that farmhouse, and I might not ever be able to explain that in this incarnation, in this life. It might not be until afterlife, if ever that I know exactly what it is or why we were drawn to the farm, but we were mm. um, and stayed there for a very long time, just long enough to absorb all of the mystical, magical, ethereal, wonderful, horrible 
experience of living among the dead. We yeah. dwelled among the dead. The dead dwelled among the living. And when mm -hmm. my mother realized that the house was haunted and we had shared some of our experiences with her by that time, I think the first serious conversation that we as a family ever had about it, minus my father and my baby sister, April, she wasn't involved either, but my mother talked to the rest of us and she said, I don't think that the spirits are just passing through. I think that they think that they belong here and mm -hmm. they probably do. They're attached to this house for a reason. And she warned us at that time to not be mean to them, not, you know, to always be respectful and reverent. And she said, keep the peace with them mm -hmm. um, because we're the intruders and it was their house first. Yeah. That's a great way of looking at looking at it. Yeah. Just going back to sorry to just go back to the uh seance. When the medium obviously opened up, um it was was it that they were in control and they knew what they were doing, or did it just completely go south fast and they just didn't realise obviously what they'd opened? Oh, it went it went south very fast. It went it went um well I live in the south, so probably I shouldn't use that term in a disparaging way. I mean, I live in paradise in Florida, so uh, things turned bad very quickly. Yeah. Um, and um, within moments, really, within moments, the table was levitating above the floor. Uh, the priest jumped up and ran over to the corner. Uh, the medium um, was conjuring the spirits, you know, talking. She had a little... Uh, like a little pouch of stuff that she was sprinkling. There were candles on the table. Well, all of a sudden, it was like this supernatural wind just passed through the room and all the light was out. All the candles just blew out. The table lifted and then it jammed itself back down onto the floor. And then my mother, oh God, just talking about it. It's like being back there again, being a 15 year old again and watching this happen and having no control over it at all. I was um, standing in the hallway in the foyer with my sister, Cindy, when it happened and Cindy was in my arms and started to pass out and fall to the floor and I couldn't hold her up and I was in a panic and sweat was pouring off my face as I'm watching the chair that my mother is in lifting, lifting, lifting. And then in a split second, she was tossed from the middle of the dining room into the middle of our parlor, some 20 feet away. Um, but as horrible an event as that was, I'm so grateful that my mom has no memory of it at all. Yeah. Uh, I guarantee you that everybody else that was present in the house will never, ever forget it. Yeah. Um, and... Um, the thing that was most amazing to me about it was a couple of months later, my mom had gone into a really into dark space, you know, into like a, a funk. She was getting very thin waif like, uh, I was 15, almost 16 years old, perfectly capable of taking care of my my younger sisters and so for a while i i assumed like a surrogate parent role and uh one night uh in october i guess i had just turned 16 i was born on october 10th so right around there it was in later in october it was cold very cold that night and so i had built a fire and i had made beef stew for my sisters for dinner while mom was in bed sleeping and she rarely got up when she did she tried to live on coffee and cigarettes she just didn't want to eat um mm -hmm. she was wasting away and you know we were all terrified for her because something was obviously terribly wrong um she never seemed to recover from that night of the seance well she came out of her room that night and she said honey um i'm hungry what did you make for dinner and i was delighted i was sitting on the sofa just doing my homework and my sisters were already in bed. And I said, oh, I made beef stew in the pressure cooker. And she said, would you warm me up a bowl? Well, microwaves didn't exist yet. Mm -hmm. So I had to go, I walked through, I had closed the house down for the night. 
I walked all the way through this extra extraordinarily long farmhouse, um, through the closed down dining room, through the dark front foyer, through the kitchen, into the pantry, and um, dipped out some beef stew for my mom and heated it on the stove. And in the meantime, she had asked me before I left if I would make a short pot of coffee. It, well, I had to use a percolator because, you know, instant coffee machines hadn't been invented yet. And so it took me a few minutes to do for my mother what she had asked me to do. Um, and when I returned uh, and started walking through the parlor that looked exactly the same way that it had when I left, walking through the dining room that looked exactly the same way when I had just walked through it 15 minutes earlier, I looked up and my mother was grinning from ear to ear and I felt uplifted. I mean, like just buoyed by seeing her happy face. I thought right. she was just so hungry. She was happy to see me bringing her a tray of food and a cup of coffee. It wasn't that. In my absence, she had leaned over, grabbed a, a log out of the wood box and had thrown it on the fireplace in the parlor. And as she was replacing the screen in front of it, she heard laughter behind her. And she turned and looked through the large opening uh, between the parlor and the dining room. And there was an entire family gathered together in our dining room at furniture that was not our own, a hand-hewn oak table with two benches. And there was a woman in a full-length dress who was stirring a pot of stew over open flames in a fireplace that had been closed up and sealed shut for more than a hundred years when we moved in and was still sealed shut. Um, and there she was cooking on that open fireplace. And there were two men sitting at the table and they both had pewter steins in front of them, which would be indicative of the 1700s because pewter was outlawed um, mm -hmm for plates or, or cups or anything by the 1800s because of the lead content. And um, <clears throat> so they were sitting there waiting to have their stew. And the woman lifted it with, uh, my mother said she had like a, a heavy wrought iron hook and yeah. moved it onto the center of the table. And there were candles and oil lamps burning for light. And she told her children to take their seats on their benches. And the two men sitting there were facing adjacently where they would have been able to see the parlor off to their left. And one of them turned and looked into the parlor and saw my mother standing on the hearthstone and nudged the man beside him and pointed her out to him. And my mother was the ghost. Wow. They were peering into the future at the same time that she was peering into the past. Wow, that's amazing. And that's what put the smile on her face. She yeah. had one of those moments where she realized that we were living in a portal, cleverly disguised yeah. as a farmhouse, that we were sharing dimensions that interacted and interlocked. And, you know, even if it was just that rare glimpse for mm. just a moment where they were simultaneously existing in the same space at the same time. And mm -hmm. her pragmatic Virgo mind got blown. And she finally realized what the true nature and essence of spirit was. And she was no longer fearful. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what I'm surprised to hear is because... You think of the story and you just think, oh, it's all evil in the all house, negative, but it's yeah. not. It's nice no. to hear good spirits. It was very enlightening, a truly illuminating time. It mm -hmm. was. That's why my mother answers that question the way she does. And yet, if you were to ask my sister, Christine, she would say, oh, hell no. I never, you know, I, I almost I almost froze to death in that farm. I hated it. It was awful. Um, I couldn't wait to leave. I never really wanted to look back. Yeah. Nancy loved it. Cindy wanted to get out of there. Cindy wishes that we had never lived there. April yeah. wished that we had never lived there. 
Um, my father, Nancy, and myself loved it and never wanted to leave. So here you have seven members of one family that are absolutely fractured and torn apart about their desire to stay at that farm in spite of whatever challenges or trials or tribulations occurred. Mm. Um, it was an uh, interesting psychological dynamic, I should uh, say, that was going on there. Um, you've all, is, it, is it true you've all been back to the house though? Yes. You have. How was that? Yes. Uh, well, I went back many, many times, many times mm -hmm. um, after we left. Nancy was so angry with my parents that she refused to move when they sold the house. And she went to the new owners and asked if she could stay on indefinitely as the caretaker while they had uh, some restoration work done to the farm and they gladly agreed that of course it would behoove them to have the farm occupied. Um, and they were the abutting landowners, so they weren't far away, mm. uh, but it was still safer to have somebody there. So Nancy refused to move with our family. And it was the last time that we lived together as one family under one roof mm. because the rest of us moved to Georgia in June of 1980. And by the time Nancy got married and moved south to be with the rest of us, we had all dispersed and we were, yeah. you know, all around the metro Atlanta area. We never lived together again as a family. And um, and uh, very sadly, we lost my baby sister April in March of 2017. Um, but there's a part of me that knows that she's on the other side. You know, if we hadn't grown up the way that we did, I don't know if we would have recognized when she's made her appearances to okay. visit us, you know, you know, that we might not have known that it was her. Um, but because we grew up in that environment, we know the signs of spirit. Yeah. And she always makes herself... <clears throat> known uh around christmas time particularly although anytime um and she uh she died she was just short of her 52nd birthday when she died and, and we used to tease her uh all the time because she loved the aroma of gardenia and we used to tease her about her old lady perfume her heavy old lady perfume that smelled like a gardenia garden and yet that's how we know when she's coming to visit. That's the first indication that she's mm. among us. I'll show you, I keep a picture of her on my desk. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. Isn't she beautiful? Oh yeah. Beautiful. I miss her so much, so much, but we'll be together again. Yeah. I know it. I know it. Yeah, I think that's one thing. Like today is the anniversary of my granddad's passing. It's eight oh, years. God bless. But, but because I've got that belief and that faith, it makes it so it's easier to cope with that you know, yeah. and, and yeah. you will see him one day. Yes, and you know, for us that work in this field, that have studied and you know really researched and had experiences. It's not even a matter of faith or belief. For me, at least, I can say, I know there yeah. is something beyond our mortal manifestation. I know there is an afterlife. Mm. And so that brings me peace yeah. and comfort in a way that I'm truly grateful for. I'm grateful to have had the experiences that I've had in life. Truly. And I'm grateful for the conjuring because had it not been for a, a massive blockbuster of a feature film, regardless of how fictionalized it is, regardless of how it inaccurately portrayed my family, it did tell our true story in grand sweeping strokes. Um, it leaves the viewer with, I think, three key impressions one of which is love conquers fear, good conquers evil, and that the Perrin family had an extreme haunting that they all survived. Yeah. 
Um, and, you know, those are primary, um, primary uh, impressions that I think get left on the viewer. And that's all true. Uh, and there are elements of the story that are true. Uh, and also the things in the film that I, I call the cosmic kisses. Oh, since we're playing show and tell between my sister's picture, my dinky dog, I'm going to show you something else. Now, hold hold that thought for just a second. Hold on. Hold on. Do you recognize this? In the film. I think so. The next time you watch The Conjuring. We only watched it last night. <laughs> there you go. The next time you watch The Conjuring, there is a scene where James Wan, who is a brilliant director, by the way, rounds the corner with the camera into what is supposed to be my bedroom. The young lady who plays me in the film is named Shanley Caswell. Lovely, lovely young woman. Um, and that picture that identical picture is sitting up on the mantle board in my bedroom. Okay. Now, nobody associated with that film, nobody working on The Conjuring could have known that I had an identical copy of that picture of the white cat, the folk art drawing of the white cat. Um, that had been given to me for my 13th birthday when we lived at the farm. Oh. It was, uh, I don't know if it was a paint by number that was very popular in the 70s or whatever, but uh, my mom and her friend Fran uh, loaded us all into what must have been one of the original minivans, uh, mom's five kids and Fran's three. And we just packed the van and we went to a flea market uh, in the town just south of Burlville, uh, where the farm was in Harrisville, the village of Harrisville. And um, I was looking through old records and I looked up and that picture was standing up the side behind the records. And I'm a, a huge fan of cats and particularly white cats. I've had several. And I just, my eyes just popped out. It's like, oh my God, that's beautiful. And I picked it up and it didn't have a frame or anything. It was just on a canvas and it had a price tag of 50 cents on it. <laughs> and my mother didn't have 50 cents to buy it for me. And my birthday was the next day. Um, she didn't have any spare change with her, had not brought her wallet, probably on purpose. So she wouldn't spend money at the flea market and just look but she didn't have 50 cents to buy it for me. And Fran pulled two quarters out of her little change purse and bought it for me and said, happy birthday. And I've had that thing with me ever since. Oh, wow. Can you imagine my surprise seeing yeah. it sitting up on the mantle board in a feature film and That's knowing cool. that my original was hanging at home in my office? unbelievable yeah cosmic kisses yeah. it's like the universe saying it's okay it's okay that it doesn't depict your family accurately it's okay that it's not exactly the portrayal you might have wanted it's okay because the conjuring introduced the whole world to our story or at least elements of it yeah, and yeah. anyone who is seriously interested in knowing more, all they have to do is Google our last name and my books pop right up. Yeah. And so anyone that's really serious about knowing the true story behind The Conjuring can read that trilogy of books. And I will tell you both that the truth is far stranger than fiction. Mm -hmm. It's so intense. Well, when James Wan read the books, he refused to come to the state of Rhode Island. Um, he figured that the whole state must be haunted and um, would not even go look at the farm, uh, chose an entirely different location to make the film. Um, it freaked him out completely. Uh, he called me one night and he's like, Andrea, is this all true? And I said, yes, James, this is all true. And then when we went out to the set, 
he came up to me and he's like, Andrea. And like, he's like a, a head shorter than I am. He's a very small diminutive man. And he's looking up at me. He's like, you're telling me that that's all true. I'm like, yes, James, that's all true. Well, the screenwriters were so blown away by the story, the real story, which is very intense and disturbing. And, you know, uh, what Ed Warren always described as the most significant of all the investigations they ever conducted. Um, they wanted to integrate elements of the true story in. And the big bosses at Warner Brothers and New Line Cinema told them to redact it, to take it out that they didn't see the point in making a film that would literally scare people out of the theater before it was over. So I don't think of the trilogy that way at all. Honestly, mm -hmm. I don't. I think of it as, as a, a deeply moving love story of a family that banded together to get through a difficult time. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a love story with a wicked supernatural twist, but not a horror story. So it was bizarre for me to see The Conjuring and to see how it translated onto film, but that really isn't our story. The, the story in the books will leave you with more questions than it answers. Um, it delves into the spirituality and the spiritual evolution that occurred in our family. Um, the priest that Sunday, Easter Sunday, followed our family out of the church and approached my father and said, this is when my sister said, see, God has ghosts just like us. And he uh, approached my father and he said, Mr. Perrin, I would appreciate it if you would take your family and worship elsewhere. And my father was so angry and so hurt yeah. My mother was so upset, um, but I understood that he was afraid too. He mm. was afraid that the whispers in town about what was happening to our family up at that farm were true. Yeah. And he was afraid that if he allowed us to be part of his congregation, that others might leave. So he was a holy man but he was exhibiting a very base human tendency, which is to succumb to fear. Uh, and I don't blame him for that. I don't. Um, my dad did, but I don't. Uh, but it was really, that was the last time. I think I was maybe 12 or 13. That was the last time that my family ever went together to church as a family, ever. Yeah. Um, my mother said to her daughters, if you want to know God in your heart, go to the woods, go to the woods. And I will tell you, so maybe that does make us, you know, pagan parents and that could be, but, um, you know, we are tree huggers from way back, way back. But I will tell you this living in that environment and occasionally having something really terrifying or horrific happen in the house, I can tell you that when you speak to God in a heartfelt way, uh, a true connective tissue kind of belief, uh, there was never a time that the words, God help me, didn't stop whatever was happening in that house every single time. All we had to do was ask God to intervene on our behalf. Whatever your concept of God might be, whether that be infinite intelligence, divine mind, you know, source energy, whatever you call it, whatever that means to you as an individual to make that connection and to implore help when needed has never once failed any of us, not once. So in a way, living in a supremely haunted house confirmed my faith in a higher power. Yeah. Wow. 
Is it is it true that you've got and you you've personally got a film in the pipeline? We're working on it. Well, naturally, you know, Holly Weird is shut down like a steel trap right now. Um, I'm thinking about taking the screenplays that we've been working on and maybe extending them, drawing them out a little bit, and maybe doing something on one of the cable channels. All I want is for the truth yeah. to come to light. You yeah. know, I don't want the last impression that anybody has of our family story that hasn't read the books to be the conjuring because it's not, not the truth. Yeah. Uh, the truth is far more compelling. Um, and so I'm working with a couple of executive producers. I think it's going to be years uh, mm. before blockbusters come back before theaters open to more than 25 or 50% capacity. Like mm. I said, everything will be different on the other side of COVID-19, but <clears throat> one way or the other, we have wonderful people involved with the project. I wrote mm -hmm. the original screenplay, and now I'm watching it be sliced and diced into pieces um, for uh, with my uh, my professional screenwriter friend Jeffrey Ward, who is brilliant, a brilliant writer, uh, who takes a, a scalpel to my work. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> Andrea, you can't put in every single thing that happened. You know, that's why you've got the books. We have to, you know, compress this down and compress it down. And what we were thinking of is, you know, putting out one feature film that roughly reflects each one of the books. But I think it's going to turn out to be something that's much longer, more like a mini series or something like that. And frankly, I would be fine with that because most people have huge home theater TVs in their house anyway. And, mm -hmm. you know, so it's not like anything would be lost in translation from the big screen to a slightly smaller screen. But mm -hmm. also, um, it's a very intimate story. And I think that it would translate well, um, you know, being in the privacy of people's homes where they can hit the pause button if something's too intense and take a breath and go get a Coke or run to the bathroom or, you know, it's a very intense story. Um, and I think that it would translate well into a mini series um, type of format. Um, my father would like to see it, you know, as feature films and, you know, I get that, but I think that it would lend itself better to mm -hmm. being, you know, on, one of the streaming services, maybe Netflix or Hulu or HBO. Uh, you know, I we'll see. I'll know soon. But yes, everything's still grinding along, grinding along, you know, putting it all together on paper and storyboards before, you know, anybody picks up a camera. You can't even ensure um, a, a cast and crew in this country right now. It's just, it's out of the question. COVID-19 is running rampant through this yeah. country and it would be literally unaffordable. There are a few directors and producers that are making films, but they are working down they are working on closed sets where everybody literally has to live on the premises yeah, while yeah. they're making whatever show or film they're making. Um and um I'm in no rush. I'm mm. I want it to be perfect. I yeah. want to share my vision of these films with the world in a way that satisfies me that I've left a gift in the world. You know, mm. I never got married. I never had children. The trilogy is my kids. It's my triplets. Yeah. Um, and I want, I want that conversion to film to be the most impactful and to be able to reach the most people. Mm -hmm. So, and ultimately it gets to be my decision, which is great. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I've got producers that are wonderful, wonderful people. Uh, I know, you know a lot of people say disparaging things about the guys in Hollywood, but I'll tell you uh, everybody that I've worked with in Los Angeles, California has been good as gold. Uh, and I also have some other projects in the works too that I can't tell you about right yet. But I promise when, but I promise when I can tell you that I will come back and tell you. Brilliant! Thank Good. you very much. Okay. Yeah, I think yeah. as well when when you get to put your own 
story out what actually happened. You know, yeah. I'm excited for that because yeah, you know, obviously, like you say about Hollywood, things change, don't they? It's not, but to see that actual, that actual story, how yeah. it actually was, I, I'm really excited for that. I can't wait. Yeah, Tense. it will be, it will be amazing. It will be amazing. I'm so so pleased with the first scripts. I'm so yeah. pleased. So, uh, you know, if we keep working along in the vein that we are and we're just patient and, you know, I mean, every time I tell the universe to hurry up, it laughs at me, you know, <laughs> in the same way that I said, I don't want another dog. Really? Well, here you go. <laughs> and if I was going to have another dog, it would be a big one. Okay. Here's a little tiny one. <laughs> okay. Okay. But, you know, I mean, I am, uh, I'm so grateful. I, you know, I didn't, honest to God, guys, when I wrote these books, when I started writing the trilogy, which was supposed to just be one book, and it turned into three because it yeah. grew and grew and grew. The more stories my family contributed, the more we remembered things that happened in groups and stuff. You'd think I'm as Italian as much as I talk with my hands. I know that. I know that. Um, not a drop of Italian in me. This is pure French. Uh, when I look back on the experiences of my life, including living at the farm and all the subsequent uh, experiences that I've had since, because you know, working in this field, once you're touched by spirit, you never get untouched. You never unthink, unfeel, unhear, unsense spirit around you. It's it's a door once opened, it stays open permanently and you can ignore it if you want, but eventually something's gonna lean through and say, hey, remember me? Um, so, um, you know, I've had so many experiences in my life and I look back on all of it now and realize that every single thing happened precisely the way that it was supposed to as yeah. though i was just living into my destiny my yeah. destiny being telling the truth of our experience living at the farm and having enough faith to believe that the world was finally ready for it that i would not be shunned and cast aside and you know I had to get to an age where I didn't care what people thought anymore. And when I lecture about it, I often tell my audience the truth of it, which is that there are elements of the story that are so extraordinary that if I had not lived it myself, I don't know if I would believe it mm. coming from another. So when you can be that open and honest and say, this is literally unbelievable. Now I'm asking you to suspend your disbelief and just listen to what yeah. I tell you. You don't have to, I'm not trying to coerce anybody. Uh, it's not my intention to convince anybody of anything. It's not. You can either believe it or not believe it. But I know that spirit exists yeah. and I am comforted by the knowledge that spirit exists. Yeah. And I believe, I think, I know that some element of our character transfers in the process from life to death, that some spirits are not particularly lovely in death, nor were they particularly lovely in life. Um, and that some were absolutely wonderful in life and continue to be so in death. Now, why do some move on and some do not? Perhaps the answer could be as simple as they don't know they're dead. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe they died so quickly or tragically that they just don't even realize they're dead yet. Mm -hmm. Perhaps they left unfinished business. Perhaps like in the case of Mrs. Arnold, that her belief was a strong one and that those who commit suicide are destined to fire and brimstone and mm -hmm. so chose not to go to the light because she didn't know if it was heaven or hell. 
I mean, we don't know the answers to any of these mysteries of life and death and afterlife, and perhaps we shouldn't know mm -hmm. them. But to know that there is something mm -hmm. is extraordinary. And yeah. what if they come to us to let some of us know mm -hmm. that there is something beyond us? What if some of us get to be the seers, mm -hmm. the experiencers, the contactees, and the messengers? Mm -hmm. And maybe I'm just one of the messengers. I don't have answers to these questions. I just, you know, have a tendency, even though I reflect back on my history in an inordinate amount in order to tell the story, I pretty much live in the moment. Mm. You know, I project my work into the future. You know, I plan what I want to do when and stuff like that. But I pretty much live practicing the presence mm. um, and grateful and reverently live my life. <clears throat> and I truly believe that I, I truly believe that evil exists, that pure unadulterated evil exists in the world because I've seen it. Yeah. I've seen it in action. And that is why every morning I open my eyes and I give thanks and I choose deliberately to live in the light. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's a choice that each and every one of us makes every day. And especially, we must be the beacon through, through our darkest times. You know, mm -hmm. this is a dark, tragic, grief-stricken time for humanity. By the time this is over, millions and millions of us will have perished mm -hmm. from this novel virus that none of us have immunity to. And we won't know anyone who hasn't been either directly or indirectly touched mm. um, by this heinous, insidious, apparently intelligent virus that really is no different than we are. You know, mm. I mean, it's it's easy to hate it, but it doesn't care if we hate it or, you know, if we ignore it. It doesn't because it's just like us. It seeks a host to replicate itself yeah just like we do hmm. you know so ultimately i think that covid19 will be an integral is already an integral part of the paradigm shift of humanity in the way that we think it will tear us out of our three-dimensional five sensory oppressive shell and drag us through the fourth dimension of spirit and mm. release us into the fifth dimension of spiritual enlightenment. And in so doing, we will wake up and we will understand that, that we're killing ourselves. We're killing our planet. There is no plan B and there is no planet B. And mm. we will start to come to terms of endearment with the planet that sustains us mm -hmm. and gives us life and we need to love her back as much as she loves us yeah. and we need to grieve our losses but know that they're not far mm -hmm. they're not far at all and we need to enter a new age of enlightenment and spiritual awareness that we've lost over time that yeah. so many of us have lost as we've insulated and isolated ourselves from one another and focused all of our energy and our attention on you know making money and and you know having a better car and a better home and a better this and a better that and focused far too much on the material world when it is the spiritual realm we're full satisfaction and fulfillment comes from i think that and this is just my own personal opinion and i do believe in god consciousness i do believe that there is a a greater presence a creator as it were um 
but I think that each and every one of us is the living, breathing manifestation of it, mm. that we are each the way that it sees itself and its own creation through us. And so we are all integrated with it. We are an expression of it. And I find it to be um, a beautiful way to live my life, mm. to feel at peace and to feel um, connected in a truly significant, profound way. Yeah, that was beautiful. Well, Andrea, I'd just like to say thank you so much for doing this for us and being a oh, part of Oh, you're so I'll welcome. Have... I'll come back anytime. <laughs> anytime. I'm scheduled next August to make a trip to England oh, and okay. to go to a number of sites over nine, nine days, I think. And um, if I'll be allowed to travel and, you know, we'll know in a few months what this yeah. looks like or if we'll have to postpone it till the following year. But uh, I will certainly let you and your listeners know in I'll case you would like to come a little south and and come meet me I, it would nothing would delight me more nothing would it would be fabulous thank you that'd Definitely. be absolutely fantastic thank you very much andrea really do appreciate it thank you all right thank you.